Ursula K. Le Guin's short story on the high marsh found in her fifth Earthsea book, Tales from Earthsea, centers around this character who is named Irioth and goes by several other names traveling around as an animal healer or cure. Clearly somebody possessed of power, but a little lost in the world. And we begin with him almost on the verge of getting lost up on the mountain and then coming in into the marshlands. Um, in the, we hear, see this, in the early darkness of a winter day, a traveler stood at the windswept crossing of two paths, neither very promising, mere cattle tracks among the reeds, and looked for some sign of the way he should take. At last, he came down the last slope of the mountain. He had seen houses here and there out in the marshlands, a village not far away. And it grows dark, and then he runs into a cow. And he says, are you there, my dear? He spoke in the old speech, the language of the making. Come along then, Ulla, he said, and the heifer came a step or two towards him, towards her name, which while well, he walked up to meet her, he made the big head, he made out the big head more by touch than by sight, stroking the silken dip between her eyes, scratching her forehead at the roots of the nubbin horns. Beautiful, you are beautiful, he told her, breathing her grassy breath, leaning against her large warmth. Will you lead me, dear Ulla, will you lead me where I need to go? We learn one more important piece of information. He was fortunate in having met a farm heifer, not one of the roaming cattle who would have only led him deeper into the marshes. And so what do we see in this? He's somebody who can, in fact, communicate with the beasts. He speaks the old language. That means that he is a, a wizard, a, perhaps a mage, somebody of power, somebody of knowledge. And he's on familiar terms with them, as we're going to see a little bit later on when he's contrasted against the cowboys. Um, this is very important. At the same time, he is somebody who is lost and is trying to find his way in the world. He is led by this, this heifer um, to this, this gate and he opens the gate for her, and he stumbles across the dark house yard to the door. He knocks on the door, and then we get to our second main character in this gift, who is going to uh, take him in, and she is a 50-year-old, something around that, widow and very hard worker who has an alcoholic brother uh, named Barry, and she takes him in, and says, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let you warm yourself here. He asks if there's an inn. She says, you can stay the night in, in our place. Um, and then, you know, maybe you'd, you'd come up with some payment for that. And she asks him, what are you doing here? Nobody comes here in the winter. What's going on? And he tells her. She said, um, you came over the mountain? He nodded. Whatever for? To come here. Not many come to the high marsh, peddlers and such, but not in winter. And then she, she says, why would you come to the marsh? She had a right to ask, having taken him in, yet she felt a discomfort in pressing the question. And here's where he says, what's going on? I was told there is a murrin among the cattle here. Now that he wasn't all locked up with cold, his voice was beautiful. He talked like the tale tellers when they spoke the parts of the heroes and the dragon lords. Maybe he was a teller or a singer, but no, the murrin, he had said. There is. I may be able to help the beasts. You're a cure? He nodded. Then you'll be more than welcome. The plague is terrible among the cattle and getting worse. So a murrin is not an actual disease like anthrax or something like that. It's just a general catch-all term like saying, I hear the cattle have got some cold or the plague or the flu or something like that. And they are having some really serious problems with that. We find that he has a very different approach to the animals than everybody else does. So we, we are told by um, the cowboys, here we go, he does that, the cowboy said to give talks at them. He was amazed, disdainful. Is he curing the cattle, she asked. Well, he can't lift the murrain all at once, but it seems like 
He can cure a beast if he gets to it before the staggers begin. And those not struck yet, he says, he can keep it off them. So the master's sending him about all about the range to do what can be done. It's too late for many. And we find that as, as uh, he's out there working with the cattle, the cattle let them walk, let him walk among them. Wild as they were and having nothing from men's hands but castration and butchery. He had a pleasure in their trust in him, a pride in it. He should not, but he did. If he wanted to touch one of the great beasts, he had only to stand and speak to it a little while in the language of those who do not speak. Ola, he said, naming them. Elu, Elua, they stood big, indifferent. Sometimes one looked at him for a long time. Sometimes one came to him with its easy, loose, majestic tread and breathed into its open palm. All those who came to him, he could cure. He laid his hands on them, on the stiff-haired, hot flanks and neck, and sent the healing into his hands with the words of power spoken over and over. After a while, the beast would give a shake or toss its head a bit or step on. Then he would drop his hands and stand there, drained and blank for a while. Then there would be another one, big, curious, shyly bold, muddy-coated with the sickness in it like a prickling, a tingling, a hotness in his hands, a dizziness. Elu, he would say, and walk to the beast and lay his hands upon it until they felt cool as if a mountain stream ran through them. So he is using magical power and knowledge to cure all of these cattle. Some that can be cured. Others, it's gone too far. He also tells the cowboys, you need to boil the water you're drinking and don't eat that tongue from that cattle who's died or you'll be dead in a year from now. So it's not just experiential knowledge of the healing itself. It's also an understanding of what is going on. So this is pretty important. He could, in fact, be a notable person in this village. As a matter of fact, he's a little bit too good, as the women a little bit later are going to say. Uh, when Gift is talking with Alder's wife, Tawny, and some others, um, Gift says, are the cattle he touched keeping a foot then? And she says, so far as we can tell, see they are and no new sickenings. He's a true sorcerer, Tawny, Gift said very earnest. I know, I know it. And then Tawny says, that's the trouble, love. And you know it, this is no, man for a, this is no place for a man like that. Whoever he is, is none of our business. But why did he come here? That's what you have to ask. And Gift says, to cure the beasts. So they could have a great boon from him, but they also distrust him as well because they're used to things not being well done in their little village. Irioth himself is a broken man, as we find, and not broken in a simple, single way. So there's this great passage um, he was mad and she didn't know what possessed her to let him stay, yet she could not fear or distrust him. What did it matter if he was mad? He was gentle. Notice the contrast there. And he wasn't so mad as all that. Mad in patches. Mad at moments. Nothing in him was whole, not even his madness. He couldn't remember the name he had told her and he told people in the village to call him Otak. He probably couldn't remember her name either. He always called her mistress, but maybe that was his courtesy. She called him sir in courtesy, and because neither Gully nor Otak, the two use names that he's given, seemed names well suited to him. And Otak, she'd heard, was a little animal with sharp teeth and no voice, but there were no such creatures on the high marsh. She thought perhaps his talk of coming here to cure the cattle sickness was one of the mad bits. He didn't act like the curers who came by with remedies and spells and salves for the animals. But this is proven wrong when he goes out after he's starting to feel better and actually starts curing the animals. A little bit earlier in the story, as he wakes up for the first day, we read, he woke as he always did in his room in the great house. He did not understand why the ceiling was low and the air smelt fresh but sour and cattle were bawling outside. So he's used to waking up at Roke in the great house for, you know, the school of uh, mages. And he's 
this is a, established by great habit, you could say. He's waking up and finding himself in an unfamiliar place, and not just an unfamiliar place, as an unfamiliar person. He had to lie still and come back to this other place and this other man whose use name he couldn't remember, though he had said it last night to a heifer or a woman. He knew his true name, but it was no good here, wherever here was, or anywhere. So every time he's waking up, he has to figure out who the hell he is and what's going on. We also find that he doesn't set a price before taking on this extensive work of healing cattle. And he really gets cheated by uh, the, the uh, you know, cattle baron of sorts, we could say, who is, is out there, who gives him mere copper pennies rather than the ivory coin, uh, coins or counters that would have been his share. He spends 10 days out in the cold healing the cattle, going from place to place, uh, working through the herds, and the, the cowboys actually leave him, his escorts, before too long. He suggests that the food will last longer if they just go on their way. And then he comes back 10 days later, totally exhausted. It, like the, the book says, it took him six more days to get through the big herds in the eastern marshes. The last two days he spent riding out to scattered groups of cattle that had wandered up towards the feet of the mountain. Many were not infected yet, and he could protect him. The hinny carried him bare back and made the going easy, but there was nothing left for him to eat. When he rode back to the village, he was lightheaded and weak-kneed. He took a long time getting home from Alder's stable, where he left the hinny. Emmer greeted him and scolded him and tried to make him eat, but he explained that he could not eat yet. As I stayed there in the sickness in the sick fields, I felt sick. After a while, I'll be able to eat again. And this is where she asked, did you, did you set a price? And he says, no, I, I didn't. Um, then we find a confrontation because he goes to get his money from Alder. We find a confrontation with another uh, sorcerer because uh, Alder actually wants him to do more work. He says, maybe you'll be looking at my yearlings over the long pond pastures the next day or so. And Iriath says, no, Sand's herd was going down fast and I left. I'm needed there. He says, oh, no, you're not, Master Otak. While you were out in the East Range, a sorcerer curer came by, a fellow that's been here before from the South Coast, and Sand hired him. You'll work for me, and you'll be paid well. Better than copper, maybe, if the beasts fare well. And so he walks over to San's house, and he runs into this new sorcerer, uh, Master Sunbright, bright, brought up to deal with the murrin. And we have this description here. The sorcerer came out from behind San. His name was Ayeth. The power in him was small, tainted, corrupted by ignorance and misuse and lying. But the jealousy in him was like a stinging fire. I've been coming, doing business here for some 10 years, looking Erioth up and down. A man walks in from somewhere north, takes my business. Some people would quarrel with that. A quarrel of sorcerers is a bad thing. If you're a sorcerer, a man of power, that is, I am. All the good people here know that well. Erioth doesn't want a quarrel, but he's finding himself getting drawn into it. And Erioth speaks, you have to go back. As he said back, his left hand struck down on the air like a knife, and Ayeth fell backward against the chair, staring. They're about to enter into a magical battle, and Erioth starts raising spells to deal with him, and then pulls back and effectively has a seizure. Gift has to, or, uh, yeah, has to come and uh, take him back to her home, and help um, nurse him back to health again. So the villagers shook their heads. Gift was a brave woman. There was such a thing as being too brave or brave in the wrong way or in the wrong place. Nobody should ought to meddle with sorcery that ain't born to it, nor with sorcerers. You forget that. They seem the same as other folks, but they ain't like other folks. Seems there's no harm in a cure. That's all fine, but cross one and there you are. Fires and shadows and curses and falling down in fits. So this is where we're left at about the midpoint of the story. We have 
uh, Irioth, he's clearly a gifted healer, but there's something quite off about him, something mysterious, something that we can't quite place. Gift, or Emmer, thinks that he's gentle, but he was ready to do in the other sorcerer. So who is this man? We'll find out as we move forward into the story.